in the spirit of Zeitgeist and why this has come together, it would be all too simple to just have a panel of, of young people that might be inspirational and interesting, but surely if Google and Zeitgeist is about something more, it's about improving and in, enhancing the success of these young people. And if this project is successful, these young people will leave today more successful than they were when they arrived. Um, so whilst you all sat in here yesterday had um, some so-so uh, presentations, I'm, I'm told, these guys had a day of masterclasses from some of the most senior people in the room, from, from Jeffrey Canada, who we heard from this morning, and Jared, and an amazing array of people, giving them some tools and tips to help take their projects forward. And hopefully, that's what's going to happen. We're going to have some Q&As at the end of this as well. Uh, but to represent that, there are three, it's unfair to call them old minds, so we're going to call them zeitgeist experienced minds <laughs> who are going to join us on the stage and hopefully challenge and push the, these guys and shape their ideas even further. So, John, John, and Martha, if you could come up and join us, please. Excellent. I would like to begin with, I think, the biggest question, which is the why. You know, we live, all these guys come from different territories and countries where there's no shortage of charity, there's no shortage of, of NGOs, there's billions put in, in aid. Yet, actually, some of the most interesting projects happening and emerging are by guys under 24. Why is that? Why is social innovation your responsibility? Look, let's start with you. Um, I think the biggest issue, and I think it's actually perfect that Hans Rosling was here just before to prove and show you all the statistics, is that we as the youth are becoming a, a larger and larger proportion of the world, but we're not included in the decision making. It's a bit of a displacement. We're supposed to take over a world that we had no involvement in changing. And when you think about the social change that's supposed to happen, everybody is debating, should it be government? Is it the responsibility of business? But then I actually believe it's the responsibility of the individual. It's an individual who started the business. It's an individual who runs the government. And it is how you mold those individuals to become the future leaders who will cause the type of social change that we need to see in the world. And it's highly interesting that, I mean, I, I wrote my business plan. I was able to do the research, even formulate the formula for dry bath, I have no chemistry background. But having a resource like Google made it all available, especially considering how expensive internet in South Africa is. And if you think about how companies like Google, which are extremely youthful, and I attach youth to innovation, it's companies which are youthful in their innovation that are going to succeed because they're looking at the young people and how, are we, how can we involve these people because they are the ones who are going to be making the decision tomorrow. Why is it that your PHPs and all these other big industrial companies are not involving youth in terms of how can we change things because the youth has not been corrupted yet. We have not failed too many times to start giving up. We still have the hope that's needed to cause the social change. Thank you. <laughs> so it's an, it's an early lunch then. Um, <laughs> John, as you were interviewing while earlier and, and getting his sense of his responsibility, and he was so, so modest about it, and you've got massive international experience, do you think this is a, a new trend, or do you think young people have always taken on this responsibility? Do you think it should be on their shoulders? Well, I, I think, uh, as you've actually uh, spelt out, uh, you've been empowered by the new world that you've inherited, which is this world of connectivity and, and connection and, and interaction. And it seems to me that um, the next step is, is out there waiting for you. Um, now, a lot of people have suggested you go and blag some of the richer people in the room for some money, but I don't think that's necessarily the answer. What you really want is uh, real, tangible support way beyond that, intellectual support and active shoulders. And this is where I think Twitter comes in. I think that if there's an easily accessible account as amazingly articulate as your own, preferably on YouTube or in some form, that we can tweet, there are people in this room, if we added up everybody's uh, Twitter accounts in this room, there would be at least over a million in this room. A million, uh, I'm probably underestimating considerably, uh, but there are at least a million Twitter accounts in this room that could retweet uh, what you've done. And I think, you know, the, the wonderfully reassuring thing about Twitter is that you know that 10%, even if it's only 5%, of the people who follow you read what you tweet. And that's, I think, where you should, you should start. Education starts on Twitter. I shall, I shall tweet you right now. Um, 
Sadiq, how about you? Uh, because you came into this not being a, a young person out looking to change the world, but something radically transformed your outlook. I mean, indeed. I mean, I entered this, the social world through a volunteer scheme run by the government. And it was actually that, that when I was out there in Latin America and came back to the UK, I seen, well, not the everism ways, just the ways I could help in the developing world a lot better. And it's it that direct support from the government that changed my mindset, mm -hmm. that helped me enter the world of development and creating my own organization. I mean, we have, as young people, we have to step up and use our social entrepreneurial skills mm -hmm. to create our own organizations. But I felt the government, in a sense, when it did open my eyes to the developing world through a volunteer scheme, it did assist me with now which, what I want to make my yep. career. Yep. And, and Martha, I mean, you've got experience of trying to influence governments and people taking responsibility. Yeah, I think it's really interesting hearing these guys because I remember when we started LastMinute.com and I was 25 and I thought that people of my age, 38, were you know, certainly not worth listening to and now I'm referred to as a dot-com dinosaur. That's kind of really rammed home far too often. But the thing that I think I was struck by when I was watching all your incredible videos was, firstly, you take connectivity completely for granted. It's not even at the core of what you do, it's just kind of embedded throughout it. And it sounds kind of trite and obvious to say it. But the thing that's been uh, vexing me recently is that in the UK alone, there are 10 million people who don't use the internet and there are at least a million young people who don't. A million, that's a huge, huge number. If you put that on a global scale, and I was lucky enough to meet Tim Berners-Lee recently, he said to me, why are you worrying about these people in England? There are two billion people out there in the world who've never been yet. Put me in my place firmly. Uh, so I'm interested to ask you, I guess, two things. Firstly, do you see a difference between the online and the offline in what you do, or is it just threaded through it? And then do you feel any kind of responsibility to help those people who aren't connected? And how would you approach that problem if you were me? Great. I mean, all, I'd like to hear all of you. Sadie, you first. Um, OK, well, my project, Future Voices International, it's a grassroots level organization. We work in developed countries. So I've been based in Latin America. And we actually do it in an offline sense initially. So we're actually teaching young people things like uh, media literacy, so how to use a computer like for word processing. We teach them creative writing. We teach them how to make films, film production to share the social issues with the world. And then once they've created this content, they have the skill sets to enter higher education or employment using these skills. But also it gives them, a, when we bring in the internet into the, into the equation, it gives them a platform to share their social issues with the world, thus educating the global community on their, on their, on their lifestyles they're, they're living in underprivileged communities. And so Oli, you've got direct uh, experience of this as well, haven't you? Well, I find that in South Africa, I mean, I was also living in Sweden for a bit, and I, I felt the difference, like, even personally. Um, even in my, in my high school, I mean, my university, I have to pay for um, internet access, which I think is ridiculous, and every year we lobby against it. I'm a graphic designer uh, graduate, and I feel that you definitely need internet if you're going to be in the design world. Um, and then for my kids that we work with, high school learners, every year we struggle to get hold of them, some of them have internet accounts, mainly Facebook accounts, but they're inactive. They visit a computer, or they visit, they, most of them don't even have a phone, they just buy a SIM card, and they rotate a phone around a family, which is frustrating even if you want to phone them. So I think uh, the disparity is so large, and, and sometimes the European market or the American market pitches ideas to the African market without truly understanding that uh, things aren't put in place, or is it just a different uh, understanding of the internet didn't, it's taken for granted, almost. And, and Ludwig, do you see any difference between the two? I mean, a man who wrote an 8,000 business plan, 8,000 <laughs> word business plan on his phone? Well, when I look at it, is people se seem to underestimate the amount of power that the mobile phone has had, especially in terms of impact on Africa, Africa alone. I mean, I would rather equip high school kids with smartphones and teach them how to use them rather than computers, which are, they're going to stick at home. And the amazing thing is, once Africans understand how to use the technology, they, I think, are the, one of the most innovative in terms of capitalizing, especially in terms of commerce, on that technology. I mean, in my high school, we, had, we have a situation where you've got kids who've got the coolest, latest phones, which have all these different abilities, but then because they don't know how to use them, like let alone just how to capitalize on the internet for a research project and make sure you get an A, it's mostly for IM services. Mixit is the biggest service in our country. And although they use it for communication, especially in terms of helping each other with homework, which has been extremely impactful, like I, I'm just imagining what would happen if we introduced into the curriculum a system where kids were taught exactly how to use phones, just your cell phone, 
in terms of how to teach yourself by accessing the web. It would I'm be unlimited. I'm really interested power. in some knowledge to be shared. John, you've yep. got direct experience here. Um, you're actually talking about something that I'm very passionate about, which is taking the mobile device, uh, the mobile form factor, <clears throat> excuse me, and moving it from a, a product of consumption to one of production uh, and seeing how, um, how that changes the story of participation in many uh, emerging countries. So uh, I think that's something that uh, we're starting to see unfold with uh, as uh, the prices fall with uh, uh, OS's like uh, Android and uh, some of the cheaper devices that are coming onto the market. Uh, so uh, I think that you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, this is something that uh, we'll talk about you know, in detail afterwards. And it's, it's a much broader. One of the other uh, young minds, uh, Anna, is um, campaigning actively in the UK to actually change the curriculum, transform the curriculum, add to the curriculum something that's missing, that we're completely missing the opportunity to educate young people correctly in IT. Um, so it's, it's running, and it's something that runs across all of the different young minds. And Martha, what have your experiences, digital inclusion champion, could you share with these guys facing the same challenges? Yeah, well, I think it's really interesting to see where the boundary between what government can do and should do and what young people, old people, people of all age should do around any kind of inclusion, whether it's digital or education or any other kind of skill. And listening to you talk, you know, one thing I feel very strongly about here in the UK is that it's the lowest cost way for the government to help itself is by making sure everybody is connected. And that's the link that I feel frustrated. I'm not making the arguments clearly enough beginning to happen in, in government that you know, by making everybody able to use the internet, helping everybody being able to use the internet, certain things start to happen much more effectively. Government can communicate more easily. I believe businesses become created. All of you, you know, Sadiq, you're a brilliant example of that. So I think that the pressure should be put on governments to make sure that they're looking after their kind of final bits of all of these pieces, to make sure the final third, tenth, whatever it is, are able to use technologies, even if it's just making sure the infrastructure is there. And then you guys can layer the things on top. Is that, would you say that was true in your own experiences as well? Where, does, where do you think government kind of begins and ends in what you're doing? Well, the thing is, government is there. I think the role that business and government should play in any society is just enabling. That is all we require you to do. I'm here, I've got the will to do something, can you please enable me? When I need the internet, can you please enable me? Can you please make sure I have access to it so that I can teach myself? Therefore, you don't have to pay 10 different teachers' salaries when I can sit at home and teach myself science. I taught myself the formulation for a lotion that helps you not to bath. I taught it all to myself, no scientific history behind that, all from the internet. <coughs> I, I something that struck me while you were speaking just before that was whether I see the dawning of a new fundamental human right, which is that to free internet connection, uh, Wi-Fi, right across the world. It seems to be a very easily uh, pursued goal, and one which I'm sure Tim Berners-Lee would absolutely um, sign up to. Um, Uganda, which is the country I used to live in, um, has better mobile phone coverage than Britain. Uh, more absolute and total. There's almost nowhere, absolutely nowhere in Uganda where you can't make a mobile phone call. It's been extremely well tooled up by some old white honky uh, uh, South African company that decided to go off up to Africa and start putting these things in, um, which is absolutely amazing. And it seems to me that uh, free Wi-Fi connection worldwide is a realizable goal. It'll do a few people out of some cash, but that's no bad thing. Mm -hmm. And across the young minds, I'm sure they'd agree, we're representing Zambia and Namibia and Nigeria, and access has been an issue across, across the board. In terms of Africa has the largest growing middle class in the world. It, it is the most rapidly expanding middle class in the world. It, it takes a different view of what middle class is. It's $8, $8 mm -hmm. uh, uh, a day to $24 a day, uh, but it's expanding massively. Um, and that's from a base of $2 a day. Well, I think it is. Sorry. Oh, no, I just want to say, like, it, for me, and I'm, I'm not such a digital technology, although I know how to use the internet and I was privileged from going to a privileged high school, I think it really needs to be partnered with programs that help the kids to do it. Because um, I think all of us are proactive individuals due to our backgrounds. That's why we entered the competition. But, but even in my university, my lecturers were like, wow, you've really, you've made it. You've, but, but actually, it's just because, like, Everyone else is not proactive. I find in America or in, in Europe, things are more competitive. The students are more competitive. Competitions are much harder to get into because, I don't know, the education system or the family structure or there's just a sense of uh, you can go and get it, where in South Africa, it's still very much, I'm waiting for aid. I'm waiting for help. I'm stuck. 
Can, S Sadiq, on the, on the point of access, I mean, some of your projects have been pretty far flung, but you've seen real success as well, haven't you? Indeed, all right. There's two parts of the question. I mean, bringing the infrastructure of the internet to the wider community is very important, but the other part of it is actually giving people the skill set to utilize the internet mm -hmm. and its full potential. Um, but I've been working in very remote communities in Latin America where there has been internet connection. So I've been partnering, partnering with internet cafes and then getting young people into these internet cafes and teaching them the media skills that they require to get online and actually utilize it for a positive goal. I mean, one of the two other students of the small project I ran there entered higher education directly mm -hmm. from the skills element and contacting local schools and higher education authorities. Um, another girl of the project, um, she actually didn't have access to school because her parents didn't allow her to go because they thought they needed her assistance on the market stall. She was working six hours a day on this market stall and she so but I actually felt how felt old was she 16 and she spent actually spent 14 hours a day right. um, on the market stall um, and I felt for this girl so I asked her parents if she could join the six-week program I ran and they agreed reluctantly but they did and then throughout their program she learned all the media skills and also she created a short film just expressing a day in her life and I invited her parents to the public screening of this in the local community. And once their parents seen her, her life through her eyes, they were very emotionally moved. And from that day on, now the consequences of that short film her parents seen with their eyes is now she's going to school. So it shows a direct link that media literacy and yep. sharing your story can and ac across the young minds, there are these kind of solutions going on. Um, Michael, one of the guys in, in Namibia, where access has been a real challenge, has managed to negotiate the US embassy uh, and their teleconference systems. And what he's looking for, as I guessed, is success stories, people who are willing to come and video conference in and talk to some young villagers of Namibia and share their stories of success and external experiences. So these guys are coming up with remarkable solutions to access. And, and on that point, so we start, we, we're talking about responsibility and, and uh, I'm interested in what you think about business. You, you're all, you've all talked about profit, you've all talked about sustainable plans, the whole lot of you are really entrepreneurial. Do you think business has a greater role to play? <laughs> okay, um, I think, yeah, the reason why everybody's a bit aged is because we've had huge debates about this one. And, like, my stance is that business is there to make a profit. That's why it's there. You've got an accountability to your shareholders, and everybody says, no, but you can't just be accountable to your shareholders. Don't forget your grandmom owns a pension, which is a shareholder in that business. So I, I don't like how society tends to treat business like it's a bad thing. Business is good for society. Just the mere fact that I've got a business that's providing a good to society, I'm doing a good to society, and they're rewarding me with profits. It's just, it's just how it's happening. And when you talk about businesses going further, I, th I think it's more saying businesses should have a long-term view in terms of how they develop society. And in terms of having that long-term view, you as an individual have to go to the business and say, okay, there's this certain issue, youth development or whatever, and this is how I'd like you, you to help me. But at the same time, you have to show them the value that's in it for them. You can't just do it out of the good of their heart. Because a business doesn't have a heart, it's okay. a juristic person. And the two don't have to be mutually exclusive. Exactly, true. Yeah. It doesn't have to be mutually All you have to do is show the value to them in terms of how they can benefit you and how you will benefit them, even if it's in the long term or the short term. But then let's not just say business is bad and they just need to do more. And simply Sadiq, for the, Oli, for the, do you, you do believe that business can go a bit further in terms of its social responsibility, yeah. particularly well, to young people? In the communities I work in, in the developing mm -hmm. world, um, I feel businesses can further invest. I mean, that's opening up the emerging markets, especially yep. things like the multimedia mm -hmm. and inf internet infrastructure, because by giving people access to this, it's just opening up huge markets. And yep. so in turn, you're using the social sector to open these up, but it will turn out to be a huge market to mm -hmm. gain profits for a viable business model. No, can I just carry on, on your business? Because I think um, Ludwig's business really kind of describes the whole problem. Uh, here he has, get that sachet out, where is it? Where's the sachet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's enough uh, to wash your hands, right? Yeah. And we're talking about communities in which people live uh, often two kilometers from water. That takes children, largely, and women to go and get. That is economically completely unproductive. It's just to sustain life. He's talking about a product which uh, could liberate these women and these children from a large proportion of the water carrying. You could never completely repeat. Of course, once or twice a week, you'd need a full proper bath. 
But uh, in the meantime, you could wash with this dry bath product. It's a perfectly viable product, and many of us use a kind of dry bath just actually to cleanse our hands if we're worried about bacteria, etc., etc. So here he has this product. The problem is that in the small scale on which he can afford somehow to get it produced, you're talking about something which costs how much? Uh, for a body cents. wash? Yeah, 50 cents. 50, 50 cents. USA. Well, 50 cents is out of the question for a family that depends on $2 a day. Out of the question. But if he can produce 10 million of these, and there's a fantastic requirement for 10 million, then he could get it down to 10 cents, 5 cents, and you're suddenly making a major contribution economically to a vast <laughs> number of people. So where does business kick in on that? Where does mm -hmm. uh, education kick in on that in terms of generating enough interest to lift this product from nothing to everything. Now, as you say, there's an application on airlines and the rest of it, clearly. Um, but I mean, I personally, just having heard about it today, I think it's, an, and having lived in Africa, I think it is an absolutely amazing product, uh, and one which will have huge ramifications. But I can't see, at the moment, how you go from where you are to where you want to be. And someone in this room has got a bright idea about yep. how to do it, yep. and I'd like to hear it. Absolutely. Well, we're going to go into some questions in a second. I'd, I'd like to hear from, from you two. Profit is something that all of these guys talk about and are quite clear about. All of the young minds want sustainable operations. And you two as entrepreneurs, what advice would you impart in terms of the social, the balance of financial and social profits? Um, well, yeah, so I, I don't think the two have to uh, necessarily be separate. Uh, you can have for-profits that sort of do good and mm -hmm. you can have non-profits that um, are generating revenue. Um, the company I work with, Ushahidi, being a great example of a company that uh, actually generates a great deal of revenue, but is in fact a nonprofit technology company. Um, so I think that uh, exploring that middle ground is uh, something that's sort of uh, become sort of like this new, uh, you know, social entrepreneurship uh, buzzword. Uh, but it's actually viable in, uh, uh, I think, the the path for many uh, companies moving forward and entrepreneurs like yourselves. So. I would just say that, you know, I think all of you have exhibited it, so it feels like preaching to the converted. If we were learning more from you, but being kind of optimistic with uh, an element of realism is how I always kind of describe the journey that I hope I've been on. And I think you guys have exhibited extraordinary optimism and need to keep doing that, believing that stuff will happen. You know, I said to you, what will make your dry bus successful? And you said to me, it's going to be successful. So that kind of belief is fantastic. But there's a room here of people who are extraordinarily talented and have a lot of money. So you need to get it out of them. And that kind of optimistic realism, I think, is, is a good idea. And I also, just hearing John talk, it strikes me. We had an extraordinary session about Arab revolution. And yet, you guys are sitting, finding it hard to get money out of big businesses and venture capitalists. And something doesn't add up. It's as though the web has disrupted kind of social change for uh, protesting stake, but it hasn't yet quite managed to break down matching up the micro-entrepreneur with the macro-corporation, and that's just an interesting thing, isn't it? Sorry, can yeah. I just say, I, I do you know what we found is that as a startup, and it's even like a startup business, people are struggling to see what you're doing. And, and the fact we don't have a product to sell, we are selling a service to a community, or and we work with, 30 odd kids each year, not a big demographic. We don't have statistics, we don't have. Um, and so I think that's for us hard. Even writing a proposal, even um, asking for funding, we're not sure where to go. Um, big business doesn't really take an interest in us. They look at our proposal, they don't look at our faces. They say, oh, th this is badly written. This is, this is not, they're not registered as a nonprofit. They're not audited. They're not. I mean, we've been going through so much process and auditing, like, kind of a few bills we have, which is, like, almost unnecessary at, at our stage. You should be looking for funding. You should be looking for investment. No, I, I um, agree. Because they're investing in tomorrow's leaders. And, and, and yeah. if, if, if they actually capture one and follow yeah. them, they can use them, I yeah. mean, to their own benefit. No, so, no, I totally agree uh, with I, I mean, and, and, and the battle we're having is breaking out of a dependency. Yeah. Of, of going to DFID or going to... Uh, uh, big funding charities mm. here in the United States or wherever, and actually saying, no, no, that's not the route. Yep. Uh, they can empower us by uh, providing us the funds, at least for startup staff or whatever. But after that, we've got to go for investment, yep. for yeah. an interactive relationship with people Definitely. who want to make money. You can make money out of dry bath. 
Yeah, that's a really important point that you don't have to ask for cash. You know, I'm running a campaign now that we're just using partner pledges. Either that's people, or it might be office yeah. space, or it might be using their marketing materials, or it might be anything they have as an asset. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe not going in straight with the cash, but going in with the thing you can piggyback on. I think uh, one of the struggles you're recognizing is um, in, in sort of translating the value that your organization uh, actually has for the community and the people that you work with, and, and making that make sense to people who may be completely business-minded. Uh, and, and sort of finding that is, it can be a struggle. I've watched many of my friends and colleagues make that, that same, uh, cr cross that same barrier. but. Um, it's, it's not impossible, and it's something that you'll learn as, as, you, as you keep working on this. And now I'm going to try and be a good moderator and listen to my panel. You've, you've all advised that we should open this up to the room, uh, so that's what I'd like to do. But I'd like the Q&As to go, go two ways. Um, I've spoken to all the young minds about what they would ask of you, and, and it's absolutely concurrent what you guys have said. Um, it's about advice. It's about resource. It's about tapping into the intelligence in the room, and several of the young minds said they want to give actually. It's the most important thing they want to do is give some of their insights to you. I've already agreed to uh, a work experience for one, uh, and I'll probably agree to a few more by the end of it. But I'd like to let you guys start with your, your questions. Here we are to the assembled room. What would your question be? Sadiq, let's start with you. I mean, it'd be obvious to ask for small microfunding, but I would actually like a project partner to help get the work that my participants create for their exposure, for right. their exposing the social issues and inequalities they're facing in the developing world. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Orly, what would you ask? Something similar to what we just spoke about in terms of uh, we do this project for two years on a passion basis, on a part-time basis. Even though we're six of us, we still struggle to get it going. And, and next year, we want to take it full time. And, and, and understand the business mind, understand just generally yeah. mentor, mentorship, support. yeah, mentorship, And you, you were talking as well about the exchange that you're willing to give back. Always. Yeah, definitely. I, I think there's a two-way exchange that can happen. And Ludwig, do you have a? Um, luckily, mine is a business with a society impact. Um, what I'm mainly looking for is marketing mentorship. According to how Jon Snow pointed it out, it's, it's a social product. It can really make an impact. But if I really want to be serious, I'm treating it like a business. I mean, I remember the first year I created, I thought, I'm just going to sell it to a charity, and it would, they'd get donations and work it out. And that didn't really work out. I've got a full business plan that has won multiple awards. I'm actually the best student entrepreneur in my country right now. and. What I'm asking from you guys is this. I already spoke to Rory Sutherland, so <laughs> him and I still have to talk about how the marketing around this could work. But then, if anybody in the crowd could give me $100,000, I'm, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. I need $100,000. I've got a huge charity which is willing to give me an $8 million contract for their sanitation, but then we have to run a successful pilot project in South Africa to a similar community to the ones that we're trying to impact. That's going to cost about $100,000. We're also looking in terms of selling the, the product on the market at retail. Kids under 15 love it. They love it. Ludwig. Kids under the age of 15 love it. I'm going yeah. to yeah. stop you there, because the, 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 <laughs> the asks keep coming. One, one sentence, and that is about bed nets, the most successful mm -hmm. assault on malaria of all time. And one of the reasons why bed nets work is because they've put a monetary value on them. People actually have to pay for a bed net, yep. for a family bed net, which will uh, uh, recycle itself for seven years, uh, a long life and the rest of it. And the re what they may even only ask for 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 cents for what is actually a $2 thing. But they've made a monetary transaction mm -hmm. which they treasure and which they will repeat. And in fact, they'll be in a much better economic situation, not having covered water, not having had malaria, and they'll be able to work more economically and produce more. It's a fantastic win-win situation. Did you have a Jon Snow endorsement? That's pretty good. Um, so if there are any questions uh, from the room for these young people, don't feel pressured to answer those requests right now. Um, there is going to be uh, an opportunity, if anyone would like. Nelson Mathos, is, uh, after being approached by some of the young minds last night, arranged a, a lunch. And there will be a couple of spaces at that table. So if you would like to join us and have a more intimate conversation, you're, you're most welcome. Um, but right now, whilst I've still got a bit of amber light left, would anyone like to ask any of these bright young things a question? <laughs> I have a question. So I get goosebumps by this discussion. It's, it's very, very inspiring. And being an entrepreneur myself, I start to think, oh, Jesus, five of these going to fail. 
I mean, there's a, there's a lot of shit going to go down because doing business is difficult, even though you're young and even though it's it's a big, big, big market. And I've never been to Africa or part of Africa. And are there incubator businesses there? Uh, I'm Swedish. In Sweden, it's a very popular word that uh, incubating. You go there and you supply lawyer services, business plans, funding. Does that exist? Yeah. In a lot of that in South Africa. We've got your innovation hub in Johannesburg. That's probably the biggest one. Cape Town has a whole lot of them, especially for tech companies. So there is a lot of infrastructure in terms of helping entrepreneurs. The only problem is if you have a product like this, as we said, we have a situation where the people making the decisions are quite old. And when, you, when I come to you and I say, I've got this thing that you don't need to buy it. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? It's not going to happen. It's not going to fly. I'm actually impressed that Jon Snow can see the vision behind the product. And that's, that's the thing. And I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> He's quite old. John, and you've got some experience with this as well. Yeah, there's uh, certainly a, a growing movement of supporting uh, businesses uh, for that reason, uh, yep. because there wasn't this sort of community of uh, venture capitalists yep. and uh, investors in Africa. Uh, my colleague Eric Hertzman just walked in. Uh, he runs a, 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 gr a group called the iHub. Uh, there's a number. Uh, there's a number in South Africa. Google just opened one. Yeah. Um, so that network is starting to form. It's just a very nascent sector, and I think as that middle class, uh, African middle class, grows, you'll yep. start to see more of that because we we need more of that. And does that translate back to UK in terms of you as a social entrepreneur? Um, yes, I mean, there is networks out there. It's just that when we're working at such a grassroots level um, in Latin America, setting up our own schools, it's just difficult to approach the very high level organizations saying that we're doing mm -hmm. this work. And it's just it's that partnership. We need to partner with more private organizations mm -hmm. that can help out in both partnership with getting the work out there. Partnering with private organizations is a brilliant note on which to leave this. I think if there's a, a, a point that comes through from all of this, all of this opportunity, speaking to all of these young minds, someone at some point opened a door for them, whether that was a door of opportunity or it was a physical door into an organization. And that's what led to them having the doors opened in here and how important, how brilliant it is that they are actually here. So hopefully, there are a few more doors of opportunity, of resource uh, that can be opened to them after this. So without further ado, I would very much like to thank uh, all of the Google Zeitgeist Young Minds.